Chapter 13 Turin continues his story. But still the young prince did not reply. Miles Cabot glanced around the little group and saw that they all were grinning broadly. They had heard the story before. Cabot turned back to Turin again and urged, Go on. You have just said that, as you dashed through the row of ghostly figures, someone lassoed you around the neck. What happened then? What happened then, replied the prince tantalizingly. The next thing. That I knew the red light of morning was flooding the eastern sky. I was. Lying naked on the ground in a garden, while just above me stretched a. Close line with a row of cupian togas fluttering in the breeze. These. Were the ghostly row of sentinels of the night before, and the rope which had cut off my wind so summarily had not been a lasso at all, but merely the clothesline itself. Miles looked very uncomfortable and sheepish as a general laugh went up. At his expense. Then he declared, Turin, you are a first-class storyteller, and you certainly had me fooled. Did it really happen? Honestly, the boy replied. And Pa Blath added, it couldn't have been better if he had made it up. Then Torin went on with the narrative of his adventures, the clothesline was builder sent in my then naked condition. Hastily, grabbing one of the togas from off the rope, I donned it and hurried out of the garden, just as the morning life began to stir in the little village. Before folks had fully awakened for the day's round of pleasures and work, I had gained the fields and the woods beyond, and there I slept throughout the day. Just before nightfall, I found some red clay with which to dye my telltale yellow hair, and then set out once more to grope my weary way northward through the jet black night. Thus I kept on for several days of sleep and nights of travel, until one night a kirkle rounded a turn too quickly for me and deluged me with its light before I had time to scuttle into the woods. Scuttle I did, however, and soon several flash lamps appeared among the trees in pursuit. The lights of my enemies showed me their whereabouts and thus enabled me to dodge them. But on the other hand, I could not see to find my way. Whereas they could, with the result that finally they surrounded me. There were four of them, for four means. I was unarmed. Foolhardiness is. Not courage, as Pa Blath would say. So I surrendered. Luckily they did. Not recognize me. Why should they, Cabot remarked, without your yellow curls and your. Royal robes. Anyhow, the prince continued, they didn't. I asked them what was the idea of arresting a poor farmer in the middle of the night, and they replied that it was this middle to night part of it that made my actions suspicious. Where was I going, and what was I doing? I cooked up some sort of a yarn about being out of a job and out of tickets, and they appeared to believe me. However, they said that the orders of Queen Formis were to make a census of all male Cupians, for the purpose of either impressing them into service or killing them, as soon as the army of King Yuri should come along on its triumphal march northward. Of course, I did not want to be listed and quartered on any of these villages, where my identity would probably be recognized, so with mock eagerness I asserted my loyalty to my brother naturally not referring to him as such and inquired as to whether there were any openings for Mechanics in the air service, thanking my luck the while, that we Cupians do not have registration numbers painted on our backs like the Formians. As a result of my apparent eagerness to serve in the army, which seemed perfectly plausible in view of my being out of a job, only a few perfunctory questions were asked as to my identity, and I was taken along to an encampment of the ants. I had picked the air service. Because that would undoubtedly be manned almost entirely by Formians. Who would not be so likely to recognize me as would my own countrymen. 
unless I happen to run across some of my former instructors at the University of Muni. I had to take a chance on that. To make a long story short, the motley army of the yellow and black allies came along a few days later bound northward, and I was assigned to one of the Kirkles which carried repair parts and machine tools for the airplanes. We then proceeded north without event until the entire army went into action south of Lake Luno. And, just in time for this battle, there arrived a large force of flyers gathered from all over the two kingdoms for the final drive that was to end the war. According to word brought back to the air base where I was stationed, the army of my baby cousin had only one plane and one anti-aircraft gun. But these accounted for quite a number of ant flyers, and soon we were busily at work making repairs. Just a moment, Miles Cabot interrupted. Didn't it give you a guilty feeling to be repairing the airships that were to fly against your own people? Not at all, Prince Torin replied with a smile, for most of my efforts were directed toward filing stay wires almost to the breaking point. Drilling small holes in fuel tanks and plugging them with loose wooden pegs, adding grit to the lubricating oil, and performing other similar acts of sabotage. I really believe that I brought down fully as many Formian planes as did the opposing army. But in spite of my loyal efforts and those of the brave Cupians, fighting under Ha Antidon and Pablath, the Black Hordes were too numerous and too well equipped, and so finally triumphed. Word came back to us that the Q forces had been driven beyond Lake Luno, and that Luno Castle was under siege. Airplanes no longer returned for repairs. And most of our mechanics ants they were drifted forward to get a view of the fighting, leaving me all alone. Now was my chance to act. Nearby stood one ship which had been brought in for some minor adjustments, and on which I had secretly grounded the ignition, thus putting the machine out of commission. It was a simple matter to open the short circuit, and soon I was humming up into the air. Straight up I rose until I could get a pterodactyl's eye view of the lake and the surrounding hills. Several stads to the north was the slowly retreating line of Hababa and Burton, followed by an opposing line of the forces of Uri, while other ant troops surmounted the heights overlooking the little lake. Over the contending armies flew the navies of Formis, dropping bombs, but their marksmanship was not proving very destructive, for they were flying high to avoid the eddies which rose from the gorges of the mountainous country to the northward. Even as I gazed, a party of flyers detached themselves from the advance and returned toward Luno Castle, so I settled slowly down to join them. Of course, they suspected nothing, until I got within a few parastats of them and started dropping bombs. Two planes fell, and you should have seen the rest scatter. But just as I was exulting over my momentary victory, my attention was attracted to the island of the castle. Fighting was in progress on the heights and on the beaches. Cupians were leaping from the cliffs into the water and swimming toward the northern shore of the lake. Many Formians were rowing across from the mainland to the southern shore of the island, where they disembarked and got into the fray, and very soon after that every one of my countrymen had been driven into the water. They all seemed to be good swimmers, but on the northern mainland, cliffs awaited an eager throng of armed antmen. Without a moment's hesitation I turned the nose of my plane straight down and dropped almost to the level of the lake, then, quickly riding her, I schemed along the cliffs and cleared them of the black enemy with a few well-placed bombs, just in time for the brave survivors of the castle to land and make their way through the hostile cordon. Yes, Pablath confirmed, if it hadn't been for Turin, we never should have succeeded in rejoining the army. We got through the next lines in a storm which followed soon after. 
The young prince continued his story, but this maneuver placed me below. The enemy flyers whom I had just dispersed. Back they came and swooped. Down on me as I rose to meet them. My plan was to fly straight up. Through them, for the reason that a target coming head on at a slight. Angle is the hardest to hit from an airship. But they got me with a bomb. Before I could make it, and my plane fluttered down into the water like. A falling leaf, completely out of control. It took me some paraparts to disentangle myself from the floating. Wreckage, and by the time that I had done so, the storm, of which. Poblath speaks, had broken. It was not much of a storm as Porovian. Storms go, but in the semi-darkness and rough waves I managed to swim. Undetected to the island, where I concealed myself in one of the shore. Caves until nightfall, when I ascended to the castle. There I found matters much as I imagine you found them, miles, a day or. Two later, except that the darling baby king, whom I had never seen. Alive, was lying dead, kicked unceremoniously into a corner, with the jeweled dagger of my brother stuck through its tiny chest. So I prepared the funeral beer as you found it, and left that note to let you know that Cupia still had a king. That is all. But how did you get through the enemy lines to join our army, asked Cabot. That would take too long to tell, replied Torin, for we are anxious to hear your adventures. I had a most difficult time hiding in the hills. And escaping from one danger only to fall into another. But luck was. With me and I finally got through after several sanctes of wandering. Now tell us your story. So Cabot told of how he had been left for dead at the blockade on the. Outskirts of Quina the evening of the assassination. How he had. Journeyed north with insufficient arms and no headset. How he had been. Captured and then had escaped in the relay station, how he had fallen. Into the trap of the ant bear, how he had seized the kirkle and reached. Lake Luno, how he had been burned out of the woods and washed away by. The lost river, how he had fought the beasts of the dark in the caves of. Car until the blue ape had rescued him, how the priests had nursed him. Back to health, and finally how he had made his way through the forces. Of Yuri to safety and freedom. When the comparing of notes had ceased, the newcomer outlined what he had learned of the plans of the army of Yuri. Would that we could gain control of the air, sighed Prince Turin. But, alas, we have not one single plane. Every day the enemy scouts fly over us, mapping our positions. In fact, the only thing which holds them at all in check is the large number of whistling bees which infest this region, and an occasional shot from our two anti-aircraft guns. By this time the pink twilight had fallen over the face of the planet. And Cabot, tired but somewhat relieved, withdrew to the quarters. Prepared for him, and tumbled into the rough cot which he found there. The next thing he knew, it was morning. He was awakened by an orderly. Arriving at his tent, to inform him that the commanding general desired his presence for a trip of inspection along the front. So with some difficulty he shaved, made himself presentable, and reported at headquarters, where Ha was awaiting him with a few of his more immediate personal staff. A rough soldier's meal of green milk and alta was served, and then the party started on their reconnaissance. During the meal, and as they walked along, Ha sketched to his old friend and associate the events which had occurred since Miles and Burr didn't with their loyal troops had left the Mangul at Quina on the evening of the assassination, to begin their long march northward. Ha had been instructed to hold the jail at all costs, as a rallying place for whatever loyalists might remain at the capital. Throughout the rest, of that afternoon and all through the following night, the forces in the Mangal gradually augmented. By morning the jail was jammed with supporters of the baby king. They even overflowed into all the 
surrounding blocks. But with the daylight came the inevitable, namely a few effective bombs. From Formian flyers, which forced Hababa and his men out into the open. Just as he and his immediate advisors were wondering what course to take, a messenger arrived from Kamal Barsarkar of Kshuth, stating that he was in control of the city and pledging his allegiance to Little Q. Instantly Ha decided to take the road which runs southeastward from Quina until it skirts the old pale which used to mark the boundary between Kupia and Formia. This road then curves northward again until it reaches the city of Kshuth. So thither Ha set out, and met with practically no resistance, as Yuri and his ants were all engaged to the northward and were naturally expecting that Ha would head for Lake Luno. But the Antmen soon discovered the plans of the loyal Cupians, and therefore attacked Kshuth in force shortly after the newcomers reached there. In Cupia there are but two principal roads running from the cities which border the Old Pale to the northern part of the Ochre's Mountains, at the foothills of which lies Lake Luno. One of these roads starts at Quina, and is the one over which Pablath and his jail Kirkuls, Bertidn and his foot troops, Prince Torin, the army of Uri, and lastly Miles Cabot himself, made their way. This is the direct road. The other runs north from Kshuth and enters the Ochre's range at a point northeast of Luno. And it was over this second road that Camel and Ha retreated. It was well that they did, for they gathered additional supporters from every town through which they passed, and they kept the enemy from making a hurried advance along this road, and thus perhaps reaching the mountains, and possibly even Luno Castle, ahead of the main Cupian army. As it was, Ha and Camel held the road, beat a masterly retreat and joined the main army as it was entrenching itself just after the battle of Lake Luno. So much for Ha's account, which I have greatly boiled down, as its details would have but little bearing on the main events which I am endeavoring to cover. Now that Miles had heard this latest narrative, he was able to piece together a very complete history of the war to date, compiled from the events in Quina before all the parties separated at the Mangul, and from his own adventures, and the stories told by the priests of Kar, by Prince Turin, and by Hababa. During the reconnaissance which now was in progress, Cabot's attention was chiefly devoted to recalling to memory and checking up these various accounts. Save for the cheers of the loyal troops, the trip along the front was uneventful until there was heard in the southern skies the familiar purr of a nearing motor an enemy plane on scout duty. Instantly Ha and Miles and their party got under cover. On came the plane, but presently another sound was borne to the antennae of the watchers, namely a shrill whistling from the woods on there. Right. Now we'll see some fun, Ha softly radiated, for here comes a whistling bee to do battle with the plane controlled by the antman. And sure enough, even as he spoke, a huge orange and black insect winged its way into the silver sky. The fight took place almost directly overhead, and was a repetition of the two battles in which Cabot himself had taken part near Saltana, while still a guest of the Antman at Watawaza during the early part of his stay on the planet. Both parties appeared to be adepts in the art of aerial warfare, but, of course, the bee had only his sting and legs with which to defend himself, whereas the plane had its fighting tail, its grapple hooks, and at least one rifle. Given a fair deal, with only side slips, spirals, look the loops and tail jabs, the bee would have had the advantage, but what chance had he against explosive bullets? And so in due course of time the bee was shot down, and fell screaming to the ground, while the plane, evidently injured to some extent itself, retired again to the southward. The bee fell quite close to where the observers were stationed, 
and impelled by curiosity to see how badly it was damaged for every whistling bee remaining alive meant just one more obstacle to the air. Fleet of the enemy Ha and Cabot and their suits drew near to the disabled creature, keeping their revolvers ready, however, lest it should attack them. Cabot's radio headset had been working badly that morning, and now apparently it began playing tricks upon him, for as he walked along he thought he heard a very faint voice calling. Cabot, Cabot, oh Miles. Cabot. But as his radio was non-directional, he could not tell when seemed to come the voice. He stopped and began to adjust the controls. Clearer and yet more clear sounded the voice until, at the shortest wavelength of which his set was capable, entirely outside the range of Cupian. Conversation, the sound became no longer a vague suggestion, but rather an unmistakable voice, speaking the universal language of Poros. Cabot, Cabot, oh Miles Cabot. Chapter 14 Portheris Cabot, the voice continued, do you not know me? Do you not recognize him whom you rescued from the spider web and who afterwards spared your life near Saltana, although you had robbed his honey store? It is I, Portheris, who speak to you. Put down your gun and give me help, or I perish. There could be no longer any doubt as to the source of that mysterious voice. It was the whistling bee who was speaking. Cabot sheathed his weapon, switching his controls back to the normal range of Cupian speech, he instructed Ha Baba to put up his weapon likewise. Ha, who had heard nothing, was much mystified, but nevertheless obeyed his superior. Switching to the bee's wavelength again, Cabot said, Portheris, once you spared me a life for a life. I am yours to command. How badly are you hurt? I cannot exactly tell. But I think and hope that it is nothing more than a broken wing joint. At Cupian wavelength Cabot then asked, Is there with our army anyone versed in insect ailments? There is, Ha replied, for my aid, Emsel, studied such under the ant. Men at Muni. But surely you do not contemplate helping this bee, for it is well known that the whistling bees, although unwittingly they are assisting us in this war, yet nevertheless do not themselves distinguish between Cupians and Formians as enemies. This bee is a friend of mine, the Earthman asserted, and will not hurt Emsel, if I tell it not to. Quick, send for Emsel, for if he can. Save the life of this whistler, I believe that we are about to receive an important accession to our forces. But Ha was still unconvinced. How can you tell him? Whistling bees. Cannot talk. I can whistle, though, laconically replied his superior. So a private was sent on the double quick for Emsel. The veterinarian, when he arrived a few paraparts later, approached the Wounded insect most gingerly, but finally his professional curiosity got the better of him, and he plunged into his work. It was the first time that any physician, either Cupian or Formian, had ever examined a live B, and accordingly it was a great day for science. Emsel's inspection convinced him that all that was amiss was a broken wing and shock, and that with care Portheris would entirely recover. So, a huge litter was improvised. Then came the question of getting the enormous creature onto this litter. He was too weak to be of very much assistance, but, by dint of great effort, and much prying by means of poles, and some kicking by the bee's own legs, they finally got him on. Then six men grasped each end of each handle, and bore the striped creature in triumph to headquarters, where he excited the wonder of the entire staff, and not a little fear. To appreciate the situation fully, we must use an earthly analogy. 
Imagine a party of British officers hunting in the jungles of India in the company of a near-human creature from another planet say Mars, for instance and coming upon a wounded manating tiger. Imagine the man from the skies talking in apparent silence with the tiger, and then informing the astonished hunters that the tiger is a friend of his, and must be brought into camp and treated for his wounds. How could they know that the ferocious beast would not turn and devour them, when cured, or even during the process? Only a supreme confidence in the man from the other planet would induce them to go through with the program. But the Cupians had just such a trust in Miles Cabot, and so they dared to risk befriending the bee. Emsel set the wing joint in a splint, and several green cows were driven in for the bee's delectation. After that, he slept. When Portheris had rested, Cabot called in Torin, Hababa, Pablath, and Burton, and alternately tuning to the two ranges of speech broached to them his plan. Portheris, he asked the bee, how is it that you know our language? Although your range is so different from ours. That question has oft been discussed among us, Portheris replied, and we have always regarded the other inhabitants of Poros as either stupid or rude. Do you remember shouting to me after the fight at Saltana? Don't. Was it for this that I saved you from the spider? I heard you. And stayed my sting. Yet, when I answered you, you gave no heed. It has. Always been thus. Cupians and Formians alike have never replied when. Spoken to by Hymernians, or bees as you call us. Why is it, I ask you. In turn. Stop this whistling, interjected Pablath, and tell us what it is all. About. Cabot, being tuned to another wavelength, did not hear him. The bee. However, heard and informed Cabot, who obligingly shifted his controls. And explained. As I figure it out, he said, these bees can send and receive on. Either of two different wavelengths. One of these is about the same as. That of Cupian speech, and on this the bees merely whistle, so that. Whistling is the only sound which you ever hear them utter. On the other. Wavelength they talk, but as this is outside the range of your. Antennae, you never hear it. But they can hear you talk, when they are. Tuned to receive the whistles of their own breed. And I can both hear. Them and send to them, by tuning my artificial speech organs to their. Higher wavelength. It sounds plausible. Turin assented judicially. The others were astounded. Then tuning back to the shorter wavelength, the Earthman continued his conversation with the bee. If you Hymernians have the intelligence to understand and to talk our language, how is it that you have no more sense than to attack the ant? Men, whose rifles render them invincible against you. I know not, Portheris replied, save that we cannot resist a fight. Suppose it is for the same reason that smaller insects seek a light. Only to be destroyed. Then if you must fight, Cabot suggested, why do you not fight in swarms, and thus overwhelm your adversaries by sheer weight of numbers? It never occurred to any of us, the bee answered, simply. We are an independent race. We fight for the love of fighting, rather than any desire for victory. Would you consider a project whereby you could achieve more effective battles? Miles asked. Probably. What do you think, then, of this plan? I will equip each Hymernian with a fighting man armed with a rifle, to ride upon his back. If you will assemble your brethren together, I will train them in the tactics of aerial battle formation. Of course, all your fighting will have to be done right side up, lest you dislodge your riders. No side slips, no spirals, no look the loops. But this disadvantage will be offset by the weight of overwhelming numbers. 
By the way, speaking of numbers, how many Hymernians could you muster? The bee made a mental calculation. About three thousand. Fine, the Earthman ejaculated. The Formians at present cannot have more than a thousand ships. Thus, with the training which we can give you, and with the equipment which we can supply to you, you can go forth and conquer your hereditary enemies, the Ant Men. And when you have returned victorious, you shall live at peace with the Cupians, who will breed for you special herds of the choicest green cows to satisfy your need for food. What do you say, O oh Hymernian? It is a wonderful plan. Porthoris murmured devoutly. May the great architect speed the mending of my wing. The plan and its approval were then conveyed to the assembled Cupians, who went wild with enthusiasm at the prospect of once more regaining control of the air. It spells sure victory, Ha Baba soberly declared. Yes, Pablath the philosopher assented. The great architect builds two peculiar plans, but the resulting edifice is perfect. Let's go, said Turin, who was beginning to pick up earth slang from Cabot. And so, a few sanctes later, when Porthoris had entirely recovered, he flew away to return in several days with a vast concourse of his winged brethren. It was indeed an imposing spectacle. Three thousand orange and block bees, each the size of a horse, winging their way through the air in such swarms that they obscured the silver skies and darkened the ground beneath. And the noise. Cabot alone could hear the combined hum of twelve thousand wings, but the Cupians were nearly deaf and by the whistling. Finally all the bees settled down and found resting places on the surrounding rocks. Porthoris reported that all had agreed to follow him in this new undertaking, and their battle lust was hard to restrain. There, in the presence of a large part of the Cupian army and of his own followers, Porthoris I was crowned king of the bees, and he and Turin concluded the treaty of alliance between Cupia and the Bee people. Cupia at last had an air navy. But Cupia by no means yet had control of the air. First it would be necessary to discipline and train that wild and lawless winged horde. And some task it was. Cabot had to take personal charge of the instruction, for although others could talk to the Hymernians, he was the only person on all Poros who could hear and understand their replies. And it was with great difficulty that he kept back the half-trained bees from spoiling the whole show by picking a fight with every Formian airplane which appeared. At last, however, the animate air fleet were completely subjugated and trained. All that the Cupian leaders awaited was the auspicious moment at which to strike. Chapter 15 For Control of the Air Turin, King of Cupia, Porthoris, King of the Bees, and Miles Cabot, the Earthman, conferred together on the situation. Said Turin, the latest advices from Quina are that Yuri has convinced the Princess Lilla of your death, O Cabot, and that she has consented to wed him, in order that her poor country may again be at peace. Is that exactly loyal to you, the rightful king, asked Porthoris, but Cabot refused to put the question, for fear of hurting Torin's feeling. So he explained to the bee that Lilla's high patriotism transcended any mere personal loyalty. How do you come by this information, he then asked Torin. And how do you know it to be authentic? For, if true, it demands immediate action. Otherwise I am loath to strike until the time is right. Most of the wireless relay stations have been destroyed. Is some supporter of ours at the capital possessed of a sufficiently powerful set to send from Quina to here? And, if so, how do you prevent the interception of messages? Torin's reply astounded him, Yuri's forces naturally expect radio from 
the army of Miles Cabot, the radio man, and so I have dropped wireless for the present and have turned to optics. I have been eager to tell you about this for some time, but have not yet had the opportunity. My apparatus consists of a telescope on a tripod. At the focus of the telescope is a small electric light bulb. Thus, when two of these telescopes are focused on each other, at a distance say of 11 or 12 stads, the flashing of one bulb can be distinctly seen in the other telescope, and cannot possibly be intercepted except on a path less than a third of a parastat about 12 feet wide, even if the enemy should learn of the existence of our device, which there is no evidence that they have done. But, to make assurance doubly sure, both instruments are masked with screens which admit only the black light about which you taught me. Do you remember? We have spies in Quina, he went on, equipped with these instruments. And we have relay stations at intervals all the way from here to there. We use the dot dash code, of course. Turin, exclaimed Miles Cabot, you are a genius. Your invention has probably saved the day. Send word to Quina that Miles Cabot has returned to life and is about to march to do battle against his foes. I guess that that will not give too much information as to our plans. March is good, for they will never suspect that it means fly. Eh, Portheris. The bee wiggled his antennae in appreciation. Hababa, Burden, and Pablath were then called in, and the plans were laid for the attack. The next morning, as the invisible sun rose over Poros, there rose also the serried ranks of the orange and black air navy of the bees, led by Miles Cabot, mounted on the back of Portheris, the striped king of the Hymernians. Each bee carried a Cupian sharpshooter, armed with a rifle and a basket of bombs. The whole formation flew over the hills and ravines which housed the gathering armies of Cupia, then out across the broad valley which divided the two contending forces. The Formians, and the few renegade Cupians who fought with them under the banners of Uri, were prepared for an attack, by reason of Cabot's message which had been flashed to the capital, but they were totally unprepared for such an attack as this. The ant sentinels, eagerly scanning the opposing row of hills for the first appearance of the foot, Troops of Cabot, were picked off by fire from the air almost before they could give warning. Then the animated plane swept on and began bombing. The hastily assembling Formians. Close in the wake of the bees, came the foot troops of Cupia, surging across the plain and easily mopping up the demoralized Formians. Soon, however, appeared the battle planes of the ants, but they were surprised and bewildered at the new aerial tactics of their enemies. They had fought against bees before, but never before against bees. Manned with sharpshooters. And so, although the advance of the striped fleet was stayed and many bees were shot down, an equal number of planes fell victims of the encounter. By night the Cupians had consolidated their position to the south of Lake Luno, and Cabot had established his headquarters in the ruins of Luno Castle. That evening, at a conference with his generals, it was decided that it would not do for the advance to continue too precipitately. In the first place, the Air Force ought not to be permitted to get too far ahead of the infantry. And in the second place, the casualties among the bees had been altogether too high. Planes could be rebuilt by the Formians, but bees could not be bred to order for Cupia. This was something which Cabot had not figured on. So, now that the first shock attack was over, the advance progressed. More slowly in the days that followed, strategy taking the place of brute force. Captured airplanes were repaired and manned by ex-flyers of the old Cupian Air Navy, and were used whenever possible in place of the bees, 
but still the mortality of these winged allies continued, until it became evident that, unless something were speedily done, the Antman would soon regain control of the air. But what was to be done? One day an aviator from a distant point on the front landed at headquarters with a message. As he stood talking to Miles Cabot, he suddenly remarked, Why, I left my engine running. How careless of me. And he looked intently at his plane for a moment, whereat the motor ceased its purring. How did that happen? Cabot exclaimed. Does your engine stop whenever? You want it to. I merely spoke to it, and it obeyed me, answered the Cupian, simply. Yet with suppressed pride. There are several of us in the air service. Who have learned that trick? What do you mean? How can mere words stop an alcohol motor? Oh, it isn't words that do it, the airman explained, but rather a sort of radiation akin to speech. The right kind of an emanation from our antennae will effectively interfere with the ignition at a distance of as much as one parastat. And can the same principle be invoked against a Kirkul? Of course not, laughed the aviator, for Kirkuls employ trophil engines, which ignite by compression, rather than by electricity. So they do, said Cabot. That is what we call a diesel engine on. Minus. And then there was born in the mind of the radio man, the germ of a great idea. He hurriedly sent for Turin, ablest electrician of the whole planet, and for Oyabur, who had been professor of electricity at the University of Quina before the Civil War. First, he had the flyer demonstrate to them his ability to stop his machine by rays from his antennae. Then he outlined his plan as follows. If the weak emanations from the speech organs of a Cupian can stop ignition at a distance of 12 paces, cannot we build a directional radio apparatus which will bring down enemy planes at a distance of a stad or more? That ought to be possible, Oya gravely assented, but the apparatus would probably be too heavy to mount on a plane. Or on a bee, he added. Laughing. Mount it on a Kirkul, then, Cabot replied. It would be infinitely more effective than an anti-aircraft gun, and the planes which we shoot down by this means will be unharmed for our own immediate use. But what is to prevent Yuri from learning of our contrivance and employing it against our planes, interjected Turin. For there be great electricians among the Formians. That is where the second part of my plan comes in, Cabot replied, with a twinkle in his eye. We will equip all our planes with trophil engines. Let us send for Mitch Fix, the trophil expert. And so it came to pass that the energies of all the mechanics of the Cupian army were turned to two tasks, namely, the trohylizing of the airplanes, and the construction of several Kirkul mounted radio. Machines for the propagation of the mysterious and fatal ray which was to stop the engines of the enemy. Meanwhile, of course, the advance stopped. The infantry dug in, and the activities of the bees were limited to the irreducible minimum necessary to keep off hostile scouting planes. Delay was irksome, but now Cabot, assured of eventual air control, could afford to wait. One day, as he was scouting along the front on the back of Portheris, the whistling bee, they were suddenly boxed by three enemy planes which appeared unexpectedly from three different quarters. Such carelessness. Why had he, on whom so much depended, ventured so far from his own lines? Without an adequate escort? Well, there was nothing left to do now, but fight so he unslung his rifle and entered into the fray. Cabot was no mean shot. An animate airplane, to which he had merely to speak and which could converse with him in turn, was a decided advantage. But, even so, he was no match for three of the best flyers of 
the ant navy. Nevertheless he brought down one enemy plane before the other two forced him to descend. His bee fell with him into a narrow gorge with precipitous sides. Although the bee was severely wounded, Cabot made the landing without mishap. He had noticed during the fight that his enemies had apparently directed their shots at his mount rather than at him, and now, instead of dropping bombs, which would have been very effective in the confined space in which he found himself, they hovered down and attacked him on foot. He still had his rifle, his bandolier of cartridges, and several hand grenades. The large boulders, with which the floor of the valley was strewn, afforded ample cover. The ant men were advancing with only their rifles, but also were taking advantage of the cover. Sniping between both sides continued without results. Finally one of the ants held up two cross sticks the Porovian flag of truce and Cabot stepped out into the open for a conference. Then, with a cry of glad surprise, he recognized the Formian. It was none other than the ant who had captured him on his first day on this planet. Rescued him from the carnivorous plant, had acted as his defense counsel in his trial before Queen Formis, and had been his and Lilla's friend in Quina. Doggo, he exclaimed, what are you doing here? I haven't seen you, or heard of you, since peace day, 358. Fighting for my own country, of course, Doggo laconically replied. But to get down to business, a life for a life. In your accursed war of liberation, you very kindly gave orders that I was to be spared. I now spare your life, for that and for old time's sake. But I must ask you to surrender unconditionally. What then? I shall then take you to Quina as a prisoner, answered the ant. I cannot promise that there your life will be spared, but I will use every bit of my influence, which is apt to be great, as I am now the Winko of the entire Air Navy of Formia. You know me well enough to depend upon my word. Yes, Doggo, old friend, I do, said Cabot. He thought intently for a moment, then tuned his radio set to a shorter wavelength and hastily addressed the bee, are you so badly hurt that you cannot reach headquarters? I think not, was the reply. Then tell Hababa that I go to Quina a prisoner to rescue the Princess Lilla. But how can I tell him, asked the bee, seeing as you, alone of all. The Cupians, can hear our speech, although all of us Hymernians can hear. All of you. That indeed presented a complication which had never before occurred to the radio man. The ability of the bees to receive on the wavelength of the Cupians had been all that had been necessary for tactical purposes. And any communications from the bees had always been transmitted through Cabot. But at last he had an inspiration, which he explained as follows. I do not know how much you Hymernians understand about radio. Have you ever observed Cupians in battle formation? Many times, replied the bee. Then undoubtedly you have noticed the little boxes which our officers were strapped upon their heads between their antennae. The bee assented. Cabot continued, these are selective sending and receiving sets. Each one contains a wave trap, which silences the radiations of ordinary speech. You bees speak at a different wavelength from the Cupians. Well, these boxes contain a wavelength adjuster, which, by much the same principle, enables the officers to send to each other at different wavelengths, above the din of battle cries. I get the general idea. Go then to Turin, Miles directed. Speak to him, and point with your paw to his selective set. Perhaps that will suggest to him to tune the instrument to your wavelength, and perhaps your wavelength is within the range of that instrument. At all events, 
it is our only chance. At this point, noticing that Doggo was frantically agitating his antennae, the radio man tuned back to Doggo's wavelength just in time. To hear him say, come, my friend, reply to my offer. Will you, or will you not, surrender? I surrender, replied Cabot, but on one condition, namely, that you spare the life of my faithful bee. Granted, said Doggo. From henceforth you are my prisoner.